بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أمين وبعد um, We continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah We are on Ayah 197 Starting the 25th uh, Rubu' um, And so we are just past the second juz um, Sorry, past halfway of the second juz Past halfway of the second juz um, <coughs> The, the, there is a set of ayat that speak on the rulings of Hajj. These set of ayat started with 196. And we read those ayat uh, uh, in, you know, part, part by part last week. Uh, we covered rulings pertaining to ihram, specifically. And so ihram, Hajj is, is different than all the other rituals. Ihram... Is, is a sacred state that you enter when you say a verbal intention. And so you say, Labbaik Allahumma bi Hajj. Or you say, Labbaik Allahumma bi Umrah. Oh Allah, I have responded to you with Umrah or with Hajj. Once you make that intention and it's valid, you, or you do it, you're supposed to do it at the Miqat and there's, you know, added rulings per to it. But once you, you make that intention, you are in a state of ihram. You are in a state of ihram. And so there are rulings that pertain to ihram. Um, if you are withheld, you made ihram, then you're not able to go to do your hajj, or you're not able to go do your umrah, maybe because you're sick, maybe because you got the COVID, subhanAllah, right? Now there's even more risks that might prevent you from doing your, um, your hajj. You went for umrah, you made your ihram, then you got really sick, you can't do it. Um, or any other circumstance that might happen, visa issues, right? Anything can happen and, and that prevents you from traveling. So in that case, we mentioned that a person sacrifices, they make a, a, a hadi, they make a, a sacrifice, and then they shave their heads and they return back home. And we said that this incident, a similar, uh, this happened in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was the event of Hudaybiyah. The Muslims had come out in the month of Dhul Qa'dah the 11th month of the year, to make Umrah. And the mushrikeen had prevented them. And they were already in the state of ihram. So there wasn't, like, you couldn't just turn back. You've, you've already committed. You've already proclaimed to Allah, Ya Allah, I've come to you to do this, this worship. So Sahaba radiallahu anhum were in a predicament. How can we come in the state of ihram and not perform ihram? And not perform Umrah, and, and, and so uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, these ayat were revealed, and the Prophet ﷺ, he, he, you know, Sahaba were persistent. They wanted to make Umrah. And so the Prophet ﷺ went to Umm Salama, and he told her about the issue that, you know, Sahaba are not content, or they're not, they're finding it difficult to accept they're not going to do Umrah. And, and how, she, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, she told them, you go slaughter and, and, and shave your head. You go slaughter and cut your hair. And they'll and, and you they'll follow you. And so the Prophet ﷺ did go out and, and he made his sacrifice and he shaved, he cut his hair, and then Sahaba radiallahu anhum followed. And so this incident of Hudaybiyah, there is some sensitivity to it from the point of uh, uh, Sahaba's resistance to the Prophet ﷺ's uh, agreement with the mushrikeen. Um, and, and so their resistance wasn't in, in any way disobedient to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because to disobey and reject the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be a major sin. It's not a, something that Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum would do. But they, were, they had a, a concern regarding a political decision that was made. So it wasn't a religious issue. It was a worldly political issue. They said, you've made peace negotiations when we are not in a position of weakness. We just defeated them in Badr. In Uhud, it was, a, it was a setback, but they weren't really victorious. We recovered, we came back, we came second Badr. We weren't like defeated by these people. We've been able to keep up with them. And we're not violating anything. We're just coming to do Umrah. So how can we accept 
negotiations as if we're in a position of weakness. And the terms were disadvantage, disadvantageous to the Muslims because one of the terms was if a Muslim, if a Muslim, if a new Muslim, if somebody enters Islam from Mecca, Medina could not receive them. They have to be rejected. If new people accept Islam, they have to be rejected during that, that period. But on the opposite, if people from Medina reverted back to a pagan, paganism, Mecca could accept them. So we can't accept new citizens, new members in our community, but they can accept from our community. We can't take from theirs, but they can take from ours. So it was a double standard. So it felt like, why are we compromising as if we are in a position of weakness when we're not? Right? And so there was this, this, this objection that, that Sahaba radiallahu anhum had to this treaty. And of course, I advise you to study the seerah. Uh, 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 and, and you know there are scholars who've done elaborative lessons on the seerah, on Hudaybiyah, the implications of that treaty, the benefits of it, and so on and so forth. Um, and if we get to, uh, inshallah, we ever do the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatih. Surah Al-Fatih is regarding the conquest of Mecca. And the Hudaybiyah was a catalyst to that conquest. It was, it was the event that really, it, it, that prepared the Muslims to conquer Mecca. And so, that Surah Al-Fatih is, is the Surah of the con conquest of Mecca. And within that, you hear the, the incident, there are ayat about the, uh, uh, the incident of the uh, priest treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Umrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Ashab. So, we move on. Now, in Ayah 197, the, the Ayah shifts to specifically focus on Hajj. So now the Ayah 196 is talking about Ihram because you have to do Ihram for Hajj and Umrah. It's a common ritual. They both share. But Hajj has its own exclusive rulings that Umrah does not have. And so the Ayah starts out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, and bear with me, right? These Ayat are speaking about fiqh, right? So when you hear the Ayat of Quran, there are roughly 500 Ayat of Quran that speak about rulings. 500 ayat of Quran that speak about ahkam, right? So these ayat speak about fiqh. And so that's not a majority of the Quran. I don't know what percentage of the Quran that is, but it's definitely uh, uh, not even close to half of the Quran. Is, uh, less than probably a quarter of the Quran is about rulings. As you can see, the Quran's main emphasis is iman and, and guidance and mor moral, morals and values and ethics and history from the past umam belief in the Akhirah, in the Anbiya, and so on and so forth. But of course, there's Ahkam. The Ahkam are a bit complex, especially the Ahkam of Hajj and Umrah, because you only perform Hajj and Umrah once in your life, maybe if you're fortunate, a few times. So a lot of it is theoretical for most of us. For people who grew up who were Meccans and Arabs and who live in that region, they do Umrah and Hajj all the time. So for them, these ayat, oh, that yeah. I just did Umrah last week, last month, I'm going to do it again. So for them, it's something very, uh, 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 they, they can interact with, they can engage with these ayat. Whereas the majority of the Ummah, because we don't engage in Hajj and Umrah frequently, we can't really engage with the ayat. So it takes a little bit of, uh, 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 you know, just kind of mental focus and, 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 and really attention to detail to understand what these ayat are talking about and the rulings that are implicated. And hopefully we can retain some of this so that when we do Umrah and we do Hajj, we remember some of this, inshallah ta'ala. So be, bear with me as we read these ayat. I got a question that you can't yeah. kill the animal. We have to kill an animal in Mecca or we? If, if you are prevented? Yeah. If you're prevented. So the brother said, if, you're, if you went in, are in Ihram, you are made the intention, you're in the state of ihram to do umrah, then you got you prevented. Illness, whatever the reason. Uh, where do you sacrifice your animal? Uh, we mentioned that scholars have two positions, mainly two positions. One position, based on the ayah, uh, it says that, um, where is it? Uh, right. وَلَا تَحْلِقُوا رُؤُوسَكُمْ حَتَّى يَبَلُّغَ الْهَدْيُ مَحِلَّةً And do not shave your heads until your sacrifice has reached its place, mahilla. So 
So the scholars say, what is its place? What is the place of the sacrifice? Two positions. One is that the place of the sacrifice is Mecca. That's where it's supposed to be done. So you're supposed to exhaust your effort to make sure that your sacrifice is done in Mecca, even if you're not physically able to do your Umrah. The other position is that Mahilla is where you are. Wherever you were prevented and wherever you have been, uh, uh, you, you, you're, 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 you're located at the time you were prevented from doing your Hajj and Umrah, that is the location where you make your sacrifice and the residence of that location is who the food is distributed to. So these are the two positions uh, among our fuqaha. And so when you do go, uh, I personally adopt the opinion that it's, in, it's supposed to be in Mecca uh, uh, and that's where the sacrifice is supposed to be because that is the default ruling and that if you can deliver it to Mecca and you have no alternative, then you do it in the location that you're at. Wallahu alam. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Alright, let's get into these ayat. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful today, inshallah, as I am every night. To read some ayat, inshallah. I want, like, I want the questions. I definitely want to engage in, inshallah. So uh, we'll we'll take them. We'll maybe you know restrict how much time we spend on questions, but definitely let the questions come. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. al hajju ashhurum ma'lumat. Hajj is ashhur ma'lumat, um, known months. So ashhur is the plural of shahr. We learned about the word shahr where shahru Ramadan. So we know the word shahr, right? So the terminologies of the Qur'an are very repetitive, right? So, al uh, and that's one of the qualities of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is kitaban mutashabihan. It's a, it's a book with uh, uh, similar verses, right? There, there, there's, not, there's no repetition in the Qur'an. There isn't a message, an ayah, repeating the exact identical message of another ayah. But there are very common ayat. And each, the, the subtle differences between the ayat carry different meanings. And so it's important to, when we recite the Qur'an to understand, these subtle differences are very meaningful. They convey a different message that the, that the, the other ayat didn't, didn't convey. And so the Qur'an is mutashabih. So that's just a lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says it in the Qur'an, kitaban mutashabiha. There is a book that is mutashabih, that is very similar, it has verses that resemble each other. And that's why memorizing the Qur'an takes a bit of effort, right? And a person, you know, they've really advanced in their memorization when they're able to tell ayat that are similar and they're able to tell like this ayat and that surah. This. It, takes, it takes a lot of repetition, a lot of practice and dedication to master the Qur'an, memorization of the Qur'an at that level. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al hajju ashhurun, hajj is months, ma'lumat, that are known. And so the lesson here is that hajj, is done at an appointed time of the year. You, you can't do it any time you want. You have to do it at the appointed time. It is a very specific window in which hajj must be performed. Um, and so al hajju ashurun ma'lumat. And so why, uh, the days of hajj are actually five or six if you include the eighth day. So the days of hajj, are the eighth day of the Hijjah. The month of the Hijjah starts on eighth day. Ninth is the main day, is the day of Arafah. Tenth is the day of sacrifice and tawaf and sa'i. It's the day we celebrate Eid, the rest of us, but they're doing those rituals. Eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth are the days of, of the stoning. All right, those are the six days of Hajj. Here, the ayat say what? Hajj is months. Known months. So how do we reconcile that difference? Hajj is actually done in six days. And if you wanted, you could do it in four days. You could do it from the 9th to the 12th. You don't even have to go to the 13th, and you don't have to start on the 8th. You can actually shorten it, right? So, and your Hajj is completely valid and sound, and there's no haram and sin on your shoulders, right? So there's four days but the ayah says, so we said maximum six days, minimum is four days. Um, the ayah says the hajj is months, known months. So how do we reconcile this? What the ayah is referring to, the time for which you get in ihram for hajj are months. What is the time in which you can get ihram for hajj? Immediately after Ramadan. Shawwal is the month after Ramadan. And then Dhul Qa'dah is the month after Shawwal. And the first 
nine days of the Hijjah are also days of Hajj. During that, those two months and nine days, you are allowed to start your ihram. At any of those times, you can start your ihram. Is, is that clear? Now, people don't start it that early, but if you wanted to, you could. Especially if you're combining your Hajj and Umrah, you could. So, for example, we did our ihram for Hajj and Umrah together. And we did our ihram three weeks before Hajj began. How did we do it? We came, we made intention for Hajj and Umrah together. We did Umrah, we got out of ihram, and we started our, and started our Hajj. So we made a general intention for both, and then we made a specific intention, ihram, for Hajj at the time Hajj was beginning. That's called Hajj at tamattu That's when you do Umrah and Hajj together, and you, take a, you get a break in between. So you could do that. We could take three months, three weeks, four weeks, up to two months and nine days. Starting from Shawwal, first of Shawwal, all the way to the ninth of the Hijjah, you are allowed to start the Ihram of Hajj. And that's why the ayah says what? Al-Hajj Ashhurun. Hajj is known months. Meaning Hajj can be initiated in the known months of Hajj. Wallahu alam. Brother Adnan. Medina Surah, right? Medina Surah, yes. When the people received the message, this ayah specifically, how did they know that they know the months? Like, how did they, like, did they know? Like, I mean, Ramadan, as you mentioned, was a month that existed before the, fast, the practice of fasting was prescribed. Correct. So these other months, they had their names. Yes. You know, the Hijjah and all this but how would you have known, like, this is the known month, bro? Like, how, how did you know? So, there, there's, there's two, uh, uh, and you can correct me if I'm understanding your question right. You, you're either asking me one of two things. You're asking me, how did they know the months of Hajj? Like, here the Quran, Allah tells us, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, it's the months of the Shawwal, the Qa'dah, and the nine days of the Hijjah. Where did the pagans get theirs from, their information from? That's one. Or the other question is, how were they able to identify the beginning of that time? Well, not only that, but or, it doesn't actually say the names of the months in the ayah. In the ayah, correct. So how would they have, like, how do you know something? Without, like, if it's not explained in the... Explicitly said in the ayah. Right. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, if it's not explicitly called out, hey, you know this. It's like, what do I know? Yes. Yeah. You know I mean? right? No. Yeah. So in this case, it would be the word of the Prophet The hadith. The hadith. So the ayah gives al hajju ashur ma'lumat and then the Prophet Sallallahu he would clarify the meaning of those months. Yes. Yeah, so whenever you have an ayah like that, that could be interpreted in more than one way. But if you just had the ayah independent of everything else, there's no prophetic hadith, there's no tradition of Prophet Ibrahim, there's alayhi salam, there's no, nothing you can refer to, then yes. You, 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 can't, you can't say what the meaning of the ayah is. You need to refer to some other source to be like, hey, these known months, what is meant by them is Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, and the nine days of Dhul Hijjah. So something like that would either be stated by the Rasulullah he would say, these are the months. And the Prophet he demonstrated the Hajj, right? The last year of his life, he said, Khudu anni manasikakum, right? Take from me your rituals. So he set by example the practices of Hajj step by step uh, 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 with the companions. 120,000 Muslims made Hajj with the Prophet 120,000 companions. That's when the Ummah had grown and all of Arabia had entered Islam. Many of them were new converts. Right? The, 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 the core companions were maybe 10,000. Maybe, you know, maybe even less, right? So those are your core companions that were with the Prophet ﷺ since the beginning of Mecca and then the, the ones from the Ansar, like maybe 10,000 or roughly that number. But then after the conquest of Mecca, people started entering the religion of Allah in waves. So you have a lot of new uh, uh, converts to Islam. But the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were... The Arabs in general, they were very uh, intelligent people. They were very rigid, tough and had a very difficult kind of uh, 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 or rigid lifestyle. 
uh, their poetry was very eloquent, which really cultivated thinking, right? Because poetry is art, and so to use art, and they had a mastery of poetry like no other society. So there was a high level of intelligence, right? And there wasn't the distractions of comfort being wealthy people, powerful people, kingdoms, land, you know, they weren't in a spoiled society. So their, their rigid lifestyle in combination with their eloquent poetry and the development of their intelligence, you, they spent, like Sayyidina Abu Huraira, he converted two years before the Prophet ﷺ passed. And he conveyed the most hadith about the Prophet ﷺ. So Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they're, they're unlike any other generation. Even if they were Muslim for just a short period, they were, they were, they would, they would transform and become these scholars in that short period. And the other thing is, the sight of the Prophet ﷺ is is unmatched. You can't, you can't match seeing and hearing the Prophet ﷺ. That moment, the nur you receive from his gaze and from his interaction and from his example transforms you for life. You never forget it. Right? Interacting with him, you love him from the moment you see him, and you will die for him if the moment you get to know him. Because of how captivating and how luminous he was. Right? And so, yes, so just to give context, right, to understand that yes, there were new converts, but we don't, we don't think of them as just someone who converted to Islam a year or two ago in modern times, where it will take them a long time to really grasp the knowledge of Islam, to really. Uh, internalize the faith and morals of Islam. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were, were really internalizing this deen in, 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 in a really unfathomable way through the blessings of the Prophet and through their own upbringing and their natural uh, just kind of development. Continuing with the ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ فَمَنْ فَرَضَ If whoever Farada obligates fihin al hajja in those months hajj obligates there's an emitted word obligates upon himself whoever obligates upon himself in these months hajj how do you obligate hajj upon yourself by ihram right so once you made ihram what we say once you're in ihram there's no way out of ihram except by completing the ritual there's no, like you, you enter Salah, you pass gas, you talk, you move too much, halal, your Salah is nullified. You're fasting, you eat, you drink, your fasting is nullified. Your Zakah, if you don't meet the requirements and you don't give the, uh, uh, you know, the shurut and the, your, your Zakah is not valid. All ibadat, anything. Hajj, once you're in the door, there's no way to get out of ihram except by completing the rituals. You have to go through the steps. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever obligates hajj upon himself, فَلَا رَفَثَ uh, uh, What is it? There's no rafath. What is rafath? The word rafath already came up. أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةَ الصِّيَامِ الرَّفَثُ The night of Ramadan, rafath is made permissible for you. What is rafath? Intimacy. So it's the same word, rafath. So Allah made rafath permissible, uhilla in the night of Ramadan. Here, Allah says, فَلَا رَفَثْ There is no rafath if you obligate hajj upon yourself. You enter the state of haram, you, can, you cannot engage in intimate relationships, anything arousing, romantic. You can't even get married. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to do my nikah. In Ramadan, you can. You can go have a nikah in Ramadan. But in hajj, you can't get married. You can't, get, you can't do a nikah on behalf of somebody else. If somebody says, you know, uh, uh, I delegate you to do my nikah on my behalf, you can't accept it. The only thing allowed is for you to be a witness to a nikah. That's it. So the, the ruling is very, very strict. You cannot get married, engage in anything uh, 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 romantic or pleasurable in hajj, even if you're just conducting in the performance of that, of that nikah. فَلَا رَفَثْ No intimacy is allowed in hajj. And, and, and if a person does perform intercourse in hajj, it nullifies the hajj, it must be made up, but they still have to go through with the hajj. It nullifies the hajj. They lose their hajj. Their hajj does not count. It is not their hajj of Islam. Done. Okay? But to get out of, you still have the issue of ihram. You can't get out of ihram. To get out of ihram, you can't say, I committed a million sins, I'm already out of it. No, you're not. 
commit every sin, you're still in ihram. To get out of ihram, there is a procedure. There's steps you have to go through, which is to make a sacrifice, to do your tawaf, uh, to do your sa'i, to shave your head, and then you're out of ihram. So you have to go through that process. People have made mistakes of completing some of these rituals and abandoning some and returning home. This happens sometimes. And they're in ihram for months, years, and they don't even know it. And then they go to a sheikh, they say, Ya sheikh, I did hajj that time, or I did umrah, and I didn't do my shay, I didn't cut my hair. The sheikh is like, no, you're still in ihram. You're still in a minor state of ihram. Like, that, it's that serious. You can't, it isn't something you can get out of. So when you're in ihram, you've obligated a hajj upon yourself. Rafat is prohibited. You cannot be intimate in any way or form. Brother, you had a question. Yes, so, it, it would be better to not do the same with your wife together. No, it's not, it's not that you, it's pre, you can take your wife, it's fine. Yeah, but, uh, but just make sure that you maintain the etiquettes. You have to maintain, you know, maintain the etiquettes. Understand that this is a time where there's no self-interest. It's all for Allah. All human pleasures are eliminated. Even the things Allah made halal, they're haram now. Every pleasure is haram. Is that clear? Even the things Allah made halal, they're haram now. That's why it's called ihram. It's a very sacred state. So intimacy, although your wife is your spouse and is halal during the rest of the year, when you're in ihram, haram. No romantic relationships, no type of foreplay, no type of intimacy during the state of, during the state of ihram. You can't even trim your hair. You can't, cut, you can't cut your nails, you can't remove, pluck your hair, you can't put on fragrances, you can't put on fragrance deodorant, you can't put on fragrance shampoo. Like when you're in ihram, all type of adornment, all type of beautification is even prohibited. And what is the purpose? The purpose is humility. The purpose is to return to Allah the way you would return to Allah Yom Al-Qiyamah. How would you return to Allah Yom Al-Qiyamah? Barefoot, naked, uncircumcised. So Hajj is a, is a remembrance of the resurrection. Like listen, all these possessions of the dunya, your beautiful looks, your spouse, the pleasures, the eating, the trimming, the cutting the hair, looking handsome, appearances, all of this, no. You are in a deep, you're going through a, a deep uh, spiritual uh, 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 um, uh, uh, ritual. It's, trans, it's supposed to be transformative. This is once in a lifetime in, in spiritual engagement. So your level of dedication and commitment and spiritual, spirituality and discipline has to be above what it usually is. And so Sharia has made that which is normally halal outside of Hajj, haram during the state of Ihram. I don't want to get too much into rules. Let's save the questions for later, inshallah. I took some questions, but inshallah, we'll put a limit on it. All right, let's continue. The second thing Allah has prohibited, wala fusuqa. Fusuq are all sins. So no sin should be committed in Hajj. And every sin that's committed takes away from the reward of Hajj. And so it is part of Hajj that uh, the Prophet says, uh, what is it? Like the hadith, whoever performs Hajj and doesn't commit rafas and fusuq and jidal, there is no reward for him except Jannah. Something of that, along that, that meaning, the hadith. So the reward, like if you can avoid these things in Hajj, the reward is Jannah. This single ritual, the ajr for it is Jannah. So it is, it is an extremely serious ibadah which needs discipline from committing any type of sins. And then another sin that's especially mentioned, wala jidal. And jidal, here scholars have said, what is the jidal? Jidal linguistically means um, argumentation, arguments or debates. So to not engage in any debates. And of course, this is not you know, debates of uh, advocating for yourself, but these are uh, confrontational arguments, where you, you're getting into some type of confrontation with a Muslim, or, and you're, you're with anybody, and you're, 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 you're verbally attacking someone, and verbally aggressive with somebody. You shouldn't be doing that in Hajj. So that is one position. They've generalized the ayah. They said that it's referring to all types of kind of verbal attacks or verbal you know, uh, 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 aggressiveness. That's all of that is jidal and hajj. So when a person is in hajj, they shouldn't engage in, in jidal. And we know with hajj, you're dealing with two, three million people. And the more, whenever there's more pe people involved in things, it's complex because people are very different. People's uh, 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 mannerisms differ. 
people's intelligence differs, people's cultures are different, and so you, you're going to be challenged. وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْدَكُمْ لِبَعْدٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَّصْبِرُونَ We have made a, you a fitna for one another. So the nature of dealing with people is going to provoke you. People are going to provoke you. That is the nature of people. We're different. Right? Intelligence is objective, but people are subjective to their emotions, to their cultures, to their norms. And so they don't see things the same. They don't normalize things the same. So when you are in Hajj, it really requires this sense of, you know, I'm not going to let anybody provoke me. And I'm not going to let anybody ruin my Hajj. And I will give up for the sake of Allah. And subhanAllah, do you get tested in Hajj? Do you get tested? You do get tested in Hajj. And with these recent changes that, that has been made for Westerners, where everything is centralized and run by, you know, some central office in Saudi and, you know, and, and it's just made the stress of Hajj even worse. They've really, tra they've traumatized people. There are people who say, I would never come back to this land. If it wasn't for Hajj, I would never come back to this land. And so, may Allah reward them for their patience, but there's also a problem. When people are going to do a ritual and they're, they're getting, you know, uh, treated in a manner that, that really does leave a scar. And you're like, you know what, I, I don't ever want to come back to this land. If it wasn't for the haram, I would never be back here. Then that's, that's the problem, right? So it is a big test. It is a test for us in our time. And all I can say is, when you, if you make your hajj, be very conscious of this. I'm going to hajj. I will restrain myself, even if I'm provoked and even if I have the right. Again, you can advocate, but don't ever let your emotions get involved. And now it becomes a matter of pride and a matter of attacking and, you know, verbally uh, attacking a person. We don't ever want it to get to that level. The ayah continues, And you don't do any good except, Allah, except that Allah knows it. You don't do any good except... Allah knows it. يَعْلَمْهُ Allah. And so this should be sufficient for us. Because when you go to Hajj, subhanAllah, you know, one of the, there's, you know, the ayat of Quran, there's subtle meanings. You would think like, why is Allah saying there's no good we do except that He knows it in the context of Hajj? There's a subtle connection, there's a connection there. And one connection that I can derive, Wallahu alam, that just occurs to me now, is that in Hajj, you're, you're engaging in this ritual with millions of people. So it feels... You can feel like you're just another person. You're nobody, nobody, you're no, maybe you're just a nobody among these millions. Nobody even knows who you are. Nobody cares who you are. You all look the same. You're thinking, you know, in the mix of three, two, three million people, what do my actions really matter? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, there's nothing that you do. There's no deed you think insignificant. And all of the people around you might think insignificant that your Lord thinks ins insignificant. So you engage in this ritual and you engage with all of these millions of people with the awareness, with the sense that Allah is watching me only. And He's watching every deed that I do in Hajj. When you think like that, you don't think of your a'mal as, as insignificant. You don't think as no salah, no subhanallah, no dhikr, no you know, patience, no moment of restraint as being, oh, it's no big deal. No, this is a big deal. Allah is carefully recording your deed and recording your amal at all times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it even more. He says this muraqaba, this awareness of Allah's watch, you should have it even more when you're engaging in your hajj. When you're engaging in your hajj. Wallah So these several meanings again, you know, sometimes you might feel like, oh, what's the connection? There's a connection. And that's just one that occurred to me right now. You know, I'm pretty sure scholars have written much more and, you know, there are many lessons and other people have, can find other lessons in this. And hopefully you guys can come with your own thoughts. Because as you, as you read the Qur'an, your mind starts to see connections and starts to see patterns and, and different thoughts come to your mind. But that takes practice. You read the Qur'an, you read the Qur'an, and then Allah gives you fath. He gives you an opening. And it's a spiritual, intellectual opening where He opens your mind to meanings that aren't apparent. That other people's mind, that don't cross other people's mind, Allah gives you that fath. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give, give us many futuhat. May Allah give us many openings and, 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 and understandings. Uh, I mean, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, Brother Abdul Rahman. That's uh, completely off topic. <laughs> we'll take the off topic. Yalla, inshallah. Uh, but uh, I've heard this primarily in Pakistan. The, the what is it?
Yeah, yeah. Right. Ulema, I've heard many ulema in Pakistan saying, don't do that. We'll tell you what the Quran is. If you try and understand it, it'll misguide you. I mean, is that, is that only uh, uh, an issue in Pakistan or does it has it? No, there's sound reason for it. So let me rephrase, you know, just rephrase your question. The brother said, uh, in his engagement with scholars, he's heard scholars advise, uh, you know, the general people, don't, in, don't deduce your own meanings of Quran, right? Listen to what we tell you. Listen to what the scholars tell you. And don't try to make your own interpretations. The reason they do that is because, yes, people, it can be dangerous to start interpreting the Quran without reference to scholars, right? Because now you're like, oh, this ayah means this. Right, and you you create something new, but then there's actually problems with what your understanding of the ayah is. Either you understand the the words differently than you're supposed to know, or you don't understand. You you or you're, you're giving a meaning that actually contradicts other ayat, so you're not balancing the meaning because you have to balance all of this together. You can't just give one and then be you know a, a contradicts other ayat or other ahadith. So they're saying it from that perspective, like don't try to interpret ayat if you're not qualified. So the advice is what? Make sure if you do, you understand the rules and guidelines of interpreting Quran. So that's I think what they just say, make sure you understand the rules and guidelines of interpreting Quran. But this is a skill that can be acquired. But it isn't something that anyone can do as well. So there's that, that balance of maintaining the two. All right, continuing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ وَتَزَوَّدُوا And tazawwadu means uh, seek, take provisions. Tazawwadu, zad. Take provisions. فَإِنَّ uh, خَيْرَ zad Because indeed the best zad is taqwa. Is taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best provision you can take. What does it mean to take provisions? And why does it say taqwa is the best provision? The context in which this ayah is revealed, the scholars generally mention, that this was revealed in regards to some uh, hujjaj from Yemen. They wouldn't take provisions for their journey because they would rely on the hospitality of people they would encounter on their journey. He's like, well, I don't need anything because I'm going to see other people and alhamdulillah, you know, everybody's bringing things and everybody has, you know, provisions. So, you know, I'm just going to share with the people. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, that is not a praiseworthy character, uh, characteristic. You shouldn't just rely on the generosity of people if you can, it can make, get your own provisions. What does Allah do? Right? Bring your own, take your own provisions. فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ Because the best provision is of taqwa. And what this scholar say here, the best provision meaning taqwa, it's part of taqwa to not ask people. It's part of taqwa to not ask people, to not normalize that. Right? Not even, even if you need it to avoid it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises a group of people. Lil fuqara Lil fuqara alladhin wahsuru fi sabiil la la yasta'awna darban fil ardi yahsabuhum al-jahilu aghniya min al-ta'affuf. You know, Allah speaks about a group of poor people. يَحْسَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُ أَغْنِيَاءَ مِنَ التَّعَفُّفِ The ignorant person considers them wealthy and independent because of their, their, their dignity. Their dignity prevents them from seeking help even though they're fuqara. Their, 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 their situation is desperate. But their dignity is so high, they have such self-respect for themselves that they're like, even if I need, I cannot put myself in a position where I lower my hand to another human being. I just, I just can't do that. And so Allah praises these fuqara. Right? And so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to, to, to these people who had this practice of just relying on others, it's not part of taqwa. To have taqwa is to try to avoid asking people. And so the Prophet ﷺ also prayed that he said, الْيَدُ الْعُلْيَا خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْيَدِ السُّفْلَىٰ The upper hand is better than the lower hand, the giving hand is better than the receiving hand. So there are many ahadith and commands of sharia to avoid asking. And then on the opposite, there are countless ayat and ahadith commanding us to give. 
So it's a balance. It's a balance. Don't normalize asking. And if you're asked, be generous. If you see a need, be generous. If there's a cause, be generous. Don't say, well, why are you guys asking? You Don't judge people. You don't know their circumstances. You deal with them with the, always a sense of compassion. I'm not, that, that independence and that dignity, that's between them and Allah. That's between them and their family. That's between them and their close relatives. How they present themselves, how they should ask, what type of help they should seek. That's a personal decision they make for them. They know their circumstances, that is between them and their Rabb. But the rest of the people, when, when they're asked, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرُ The beggar, don't ever reject. Don't ever be harsh to the beggar. Assist, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, he either gave or he responded with a gentle response. So it wasn't like, you know, subhanAllah, sometimes you ask somebody, for it, like, can you help me with this thing? And they're just like, they say a response that is offensive. Yeah. It's kind of, it, 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 you feel uh, 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 kind of um, belittled or looked down upon by that person. And you're like, I should have never asked you. Right? You kind of leave that, that, that position. Like, I it doesn't have to be financial. It can just be like, do me a favor or, or come give me a You're like, oh yeah, you're always asking for something. What's wrong with you? Right? They say something of that sort. It makes you really feel degraded by that person. Right? A, a person should never do that. The Prophet when he was questioned, he would give. And if he couldn't give, he would say something gentle. You wouldn't leave upset. Even if you got nothing, you came empty-handed, but his gentleness, alayhi salatu wasalam, left you feeling like he really does care. But just right now, he, he doesn't have the means to assist me. Right? So there's that, that thing about, you know, when people ask, it isn't just material. You can give through your kindness and your, 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 you know, your, your empathy and your compassion, right? And so the Prophet was very generous with his empathy and compassion. Oftentimes, we, subhanAllah, we lack that, that generosity. We miss that. We think generosity is just material and we miss that generosity. Actually, that's most impactful is how you treat a person and how dignified you make them feel before you give them something, right? Before you give them an object. Uh, and, and so here, that ayah is speaking about that, telling these, 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 some of these group of hujjaj, what does the wadu take provisions? فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادِ taqwa. The best provision is taqwa. And this, people generalize it, and you can generalize the ayah. Take provisions of the dunya, meaning work hard, earn money, or have a house, get married, have, do all that. But understand, the best provision you can accumulate in the dunya, in a broader sense, is the taqwa of Allah, because that's the zad that's going to help you in the akhirah. Do you see how they generalize it? So when there's a specific context, it's the context of hajj. And then if you were to generalize the ayah, it's the context of life as a whole. That the entire world is all about getting provisions to survive the world. And then the most important one is the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to succeed in our journey. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُونِ ya أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ And fear me. All intelligent, all intelligent people. What taquni ya ulil albab. And so Allah here commands again taqwa to be mindful, to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then He addresses the, these people, these believers, as people of intelligence, right? Meaning people of wisdom. When you are truly wise and intelligent and objective, you will fear Allah. The only reason a person doesn't have the taqwa of Allah. Is because there's a lack in their wisdom. There's a lack in their, in their insensibility. They're, they're being influenced by their desires. They're being influenced by their temptations. They haven't developed the self-restraint to overcome their, their, their pleasures. And that's why they haven't been able to fear Allah. But Allah says, if you, so if you are truly intelligent, you will fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, 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 and, and subhanAllah, there's much more that can be said, right? Because Islam, we believe, and it's proven that it is based on ration. Belief in Allah and living according to the command of Allah is the most sensible thing to do. And whoever is not doing it is doing something insensible. And that is why those who disbelieve, they're treated, they're like, Allah describes them as cattle. Like you just, you've, you disabled, you, you've disabled your minds from understanding the greatest truth. And those who are sinful, Allah says, they're just, they're oppressing themselves. They've become slaves to their desires. 
right? And so to submit to Allah, the more a person is able to understand that and pursue that and, 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 and attain that, the more they have matured and have attained wisdom. May Allah grant, grant us wisdom. Uh, let's continue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 198, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِّن رَبِّكُمْ لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ There is none upon you junah. Junah means a, 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 a sin or a burden. There is no sin upon you. Upon you for doing what? أَن تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِّن رَبِّكُمْ If you seek, تَبْتَغُوا means to seek something. What are you seeking? Fadl. You're seeking the bounty of Allah. Right? Fadlan. From mir rabbikum, from your Lord. What is the bounty of Allah that's being referred to here? What is the bounty of Allah? When we say fadl, fadlullah, it means the accumulation of wealth. Accumulation of wealth. Ya ayu alladhi namanu, idha nudi ala salati min yawmi al-jum'ati, fas'au ila dhikri Allah wa dharubi'ah, dhalakum khalu lakum min kuntum ta'lamun, fa idha qudiyati salatu, fantashiru fil ardi, wa batahu min fadlullah. Allah says that the prayer is over in Jum'ah, it's spread on the land, Seek the favor of Allah. Seek the favor of Allah means go work. Earn, earn income. Right? Engage in trade. Right? Get paid. That you, when you're engaging in trade and you're earning, you're seeking the favor of Allah. It's something praiseworthy and something that Allah commands. So here Allah says, there's no sin upon you if you seek the fadl of Allah. If you seek the bounty of Allah. So the reason this ayah is being mentioned, the context is, some of the companions thought, oh, we can't get married. We can't be intimate. We can't cut our hairs. We can't trim our nails. We can't use fragrances. Then, then we can't work when we're in ihram. You can't engage in trade when you're in ihram. That was kind of the rational conclusion that some people had come to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no. There's no sin upon you to engage in trade and to seek the bounty of Allah while you're performing your hajj, while you're in a state of ihram. You can work, you can trade, you can do whatever you need to do, labor, get paid, uh, provide a service, sell merchandise, buy merchandise, completely fine. Trade is not haram in ihram. Trade is not haram in ihram. So that's the ayah is making that exception so that some, there's no misunderstanding because all of these halal things have become haram and then some people might conclude that trade is also haram. Yes, brother. Being reborn, yes, yes, right, in, in a, in a sin, sinless state. Not talking about like, hey, let's make a deal. Yeah. That? And I think that because one of the, the brother asked a very good question, right? Like when we talk about this on a, on, a, on, a, on a spiritual sense, right? Like all of these things are haram to really like engage us, to really develop a sense of humility. Um, I mean, there could be many things that could be said. One is the things... That are prohibited are things we engage with our physical body, things that we actually like do to beautify ourselves, engage in pleasures and things of that sort, right? And so when you engage in trade, you're not necessarily engaging in a pleasure, you're engaging in a labor for a worldly benefit, right? So there could be made, that subtle difference could be made. What's another difference that maybe is a stronger reason? And I don't have the full answer, I'm just sharing my initial thoughts. Uh, another difference that can be made is because of the necessity of earning. Not everybody has the luxury to disengage in work. And people, people are living day by day. Right? People are the haram living day by day. But they want to do hajj. You tell them, okay, you can't do hajj for a week. They're like, I don't have anything to eat. I don't have money. To, I can't earn to buy my meal to survive the hajj. So they could be just because of the financial necessity. Not everybody has that 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 that. that um, uh, financial uh, independence where they can be like, oh, I'm just going to leave work completely, right? So it could be because of that, considering people's circumstances. So, but yes, uh, with that, you can say, yeah, it's better to not engage in trade, right? Like that would be more superior because you're like, okay, I'm leaving the dunya. I'm not coming all the way to Mecca and I spent all this time and I made this journey just for me to what? Engage in trade and business while I'm on my hajj and my umrah and, and so on and so forth, right? So that would be superior, but not if, if you can't afford that you know, that type of comfort, then you're allowed to engage in trade. Wallahu alam. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, continuing with the ayat, ayah 190, uh, we, we read 190, 198, we started reading 198. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهِ 
And when you are afadhtum, it says return from Arafat. Or it's, it's actually, I would say, afadhtum in Arafat, when you depart from Arafat. They use the term return. I don't know how, what your translations give. Do they, do they, huh? When you? Pour down from Arafat. A father is to pour down, yes. So when you pour down from Arafat, you depart from, or you descend from Arafat, because Arafat is a mountain, right? So when you descend from Arafat, now the entire area of Arafat uh, is not just a mountain. It's a broad area. But it's named at Arafat because there's a mountain called Arafat. All right? And there's a whole discussion about with the scholars. Why did they call it Arafah? Why did they get named Arafah? I'm sorry. But I don't want to get into that. But the, the ruling is when you pour down from Arafah, when you descend from Arafah, remember Allah. Fadhkurullah indal mash'aril haram at, remember Allah, at al mash'ar al haram. How do they translate mash'ar? Mash'ar is, huh? Monument, at the sacred monument. What do we have? Over, do we have a different word? With, uh, mash'ar. mash'ar, yeah, the word mash'ar, the 198. Oh, one words, <laughs> no worries, no worries. So, yeah, so the monument, al mash'ar al haram, the sacred monument. The monument. The monument, okay. We'll go with that translation. So, when you descend from Arafat, remember Allah. At the sacred monument. This monument that's being referred to is the location of Muzdalifa. It's called Muzdalifa. The, 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 the term that is used prophetically and, and also in, in the books is Muzdalifa. Go to this geographically, it's called Muzdalifa. So when do you go to Muzdalifa? Time wise, on the ninth day, you are on Arafah from Fajr to Maghrib. The Maghrib of, at Maghrib time, you leave Arafah, you go and camp in Muzdalifa. It's another site. All right? You go to Muzdalifa. Why is Muzdalifa called the sacred monument? Because the location of Muzdalifa is part of the Haram of Mecca. Remember we said Haram of Mecca is an is a, is a area that is sacred in Mecca? The Muzdalifa, the sacred monument, is part of that Haram. So Allah says, go to this area and remember Allah in Muzdalifa. So now, time-wise, ninth day of Hajj, where are you at? Arafah. At the end of that day, you go to Muzdalifa, you camp at Muzdalifa. And you make zikr and dua and recite Quran while you're at Muzdalifa. Allah says, Fadhkurullah. Remember Allah at al Mash'ar al-Haram, the sacred uh, monument. And people camp literally on the floors. There's like rugs, really thin rugs uh, or, or carpets they put on the floor. And you can literally feel the rocks and you just put your, a little pillow under your head. Uh, we didn't have blankets, we just kind of slept. for. We, some people barely even sleep because you're literally there from Maghrib to like 4 a.m. And then you're gone. So maybe you get like two hours sharai and then you're moving. So they go to Muzdalifa, you take maybe a quick nap and then you get up and, and you're rolling and you're moving on to the next ritual. The last sermon of the Prophet ﷺ was that in Muzdalifa. I know that there's a khutbah in Arafah. I don't think there's a khutbah in Muzdalifa. And I, I saw, yeah, I know there's a khutbah of Arafah, but I don't remember there being part of the Sunnah to deliver a khutbah in Muzdalifa. No, well, no, no, no. I'm just saying it, 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 uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ last sermon was, in, was in, not his last sermon, his khutbah to wada, his farewell sermon, uh, was in Hajj. At what part of the ritual was it? I don't recall. I can search it and inshallah maybe get, get to that tomorrow night. By the way, we'll have tafsir tomorrow night to make up for last night inshallah ta'ala. Um, continuing, Fadhkurullah and al Mash'ar al Haram. Remember Allah at the sacred monument. The sacred monument here is what? Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa. Wadhkuruhu kama hadakum. And remember him as he has guided you. Wadhkuruhu. كَمَا هَدَاكُمْ وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الضَّالِّينَ And you were before this time لَمِنَ الضَّالِّينَ uh, from the uh, 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 misguided people astray. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to be grateful 
for the blessing of Allah's guidance. And subhanAllah, this is just like in, in, in Shahr Ramadan. Allah says, Well, to kabbiru Allah ala ma hadakum. Allah's guidance is the greatest favor. It's just most people don't, they know it intellectually, but they don't internalize it spiritually. Right? Everybody's like, Oh, I know, like Islam is the most important thing in my life. But then when you act and you live and you do what you do, you haven't really internalized that, 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 that belief, right? So stating something is different than internalizing it and embodying it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to really internalize this meaning and to really have a sense of gratitude and appreciation for the guidance of Allah and understand that if it wasn't for Allah's guidance, we would have been astray, right? All of us, where, where, where were our ancestors before Islam? Who, who, what were they worshipping? What religion were they following? There would have been no Rasulullah Sallallahu There would have been no Quran. There would have been no truth. Right? And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has favored us that our ancestors became Muslim. And so us as a generation, we have to be grateful for that. That we are people born into Muslim households. And among those people, we are today a people in the masjid. While there are countless others who barely even go to the masjid or never go to the masjid. So all of this is something we should be grateful for. And in the, in the, in the, in the ritual of Hajj especially, right? Be grateful for this guidance of Allah. Your Lord has allowed you to know Him. You have known the greatest beauty and the greatest truth and the greatest reality. The absolute perfection is Allah Jalla Jalal. Right. So the ayah is calling to this. And of course it's addressing Sahaba first and foremost. And so for them to reflect on Jahiliyyah before Rasulullah and to appreciate this Islam as it has been given to them uh, uh, with the Prophet ثُمَّ أَفِيضُوا uh, And we'll conclude with this ayah. ثُمَّ أَفِيضُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَفَاضَ النَّاسِ And then descend from where the people descend. Or from where the people have descended. And, and so what it means, descend from where the people have descended, um, it's, re- it's addressing the practice of Quraysh, as a lot of scholars mentioned, that Quraysh did not used to go out to Arafah. And the reason they didn't used to go out to Arafah, they would say, we are the people of, of Mecca, we are the people of Homs, like we're the people who are always engaged in worship and, and ibadah and in the, in the haram. So we don't have to go to Arafah. Why? Because Arafah is outside the boundaries of the haram. So they, would, they had a practice during Hajj, they wouldn't go to Arafah like all the other Hajjaj, they would stay in Mecca, Everybody else would go to Arafah, and then they would meet the Hujaj in Muzdalifah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specifically addressing this, this practice of Quraysh, where they used to be like, oh, you know, we're the chosen people of God. We're, we're in the sacred land. We don't got to go. We're just going to wait here. We're going to go to Muzdalifah. That's in the sacred land. Arafah is not part of the sacred land, so we're not going to go out there. We're above that. The Prophet Sallam, before Islam, he used to go and make, he, because Allah made Hajj before Islam. Right? He had one Hajj in Islam. But before Islam, or not in Islam, he had one hajj in Medina. That's more correct. One hajj in Medina. But before that, the Prophet had many hajjs. So when he used to make hajj, he, used, he was one of the few, if not the only Qurayshi that would go to Arafah. He would refuse that, that discrimination. We're superior. We don't need to go to Arafah. So the ayah here addresses them and also you know, of course, confirming the practice of the Prophet ﷺ, as Allah had guided him to the truth even before he was a prophet and over, even before the commands had come down. And so Allah commanded them, and then descend from where the people have descended, referring to Arafah. Wastaghfirullah and seek the, and ask the forgiveness of Allah. And we know that we always seek the forgiveness of Allah. Always. Some people they make the mistake thinking like, well, I perform all my wajib, I don't do anything haram, so what am I seeking forgiveness for? Right? And, 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 you're seeking, and you always seek forgiveness because of your inability to truly worship Allah as He deserves. That's what you're, you're seeking forgiveness for your, the spiritual sins that you, 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 that you might make and you don't even know you're making. You're seeking forgiveness so that Allah protects you from making further sins. Right? So, so we have to, you know, that's the trap of shaitan to make us think like, I do the wajib, I don't do haram. I don't, what am I going to make a zikfar for? Today, I'm sinless. You know, you go home one day, and you're like, Alhamdulillah, today I was a perfect Muslim, I'm sinless. Did you worship Allah as He deserves? Did you give Allah the haq He deserves? You can, you ask Allah for forgiveness. 
And then, of course, there's forgiveness for specific sins, and that's different as well. And so Allah says, seek forgiveness, because you cannot perform hajj as Allah truly deserves. You seek forgiveness. ثُمَّ أَفِيضُ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَفَاضَ النَّاسِ uh, and another reason to seek forgiveness is because we oftentimes don't perform ibadah at our actual potential. We're also kind of like taking it easy, right? We could focus better. We could be more mindful, but we don't, we don't give that full attention. So you seek forgiveness for your, your lack of action and lack of sacrifice and lack of dedication. That needs forgiveness, right? So we always need forgiveness no matter how adherent we might be to the sharia. وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. May Allah forgive us all and show us and grant us mercy in this dunya and akhirah. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.